cycle takes us from the beginning to the end of the cycle and teaches us the journey that we should be taking <clears throat> some of us understand this cycle well some of us uh, understand it and go on to this pathway quickly some of us unfortunately don't understand the cycle at all um, and there's a big difference between the two so the journey the journey that we're going to go through today is this cycle of repentance is this cycle of the forgiveness of god the beginning of the journey to the end of the journey um, and it goes this way the beginning point is is that unfortunately we all sin every one of us sins no one can escape sin saint paul is clear on that there's none righteous no one will escape this idea of sin or committing mistakes in front of god it's a journey that we will all face even the way this this parable is written it's written as a father had two sons okay he had the son that stayed at home and he had the son that took the money and wasted it and squandered it but both are on the journey and as you read the parable you discover clearly that both sons have to return to the father one the younger son the one the more obvious sinner actually comes back sooner the second son at the end of the parable we don't know if he returns but both are on the journey um, and so part of the understanding of this idea of the forgiveness of God is that we recognize that one, we are all sinners and that two, we don't judge other people. We must forgive those around us. No one is righteous because we're all under the same condition. We're under the same mistakes. Uh, yesterday, the gospel was about the idea of forgiving one another. And Abu Namina was giving a sermon on it. He said, just be careful the way that you judge other people, the way that you refuse to forgive other people, because that's the same standard God will apply to you. If you're going to hold people to a high standard, then God will apply the same standard to you and you will make the same mistakes as them. So the journey for all of us starts at this point. Even for those of us that maybe see ourselves not in that way, is that we are all sinners, we all commit sin, and we all start the journey in the same place. But thank God the journey doesn't finish there. The journey continues. So the son, he committed the sin, he disappeared. Um, but then we have to think about as the son commits the sin and he leaves the father, what's the father's feeling? St. Isaac the Syrian, he says, As a handful of sand thrown into the ocean, so are the sins of all flesh as compared with the mind of God. So St. Isaac is saying that even though sometimes our sin feels really big, sometimes we feel we're very far from the Father, the, Father, the Father's mind is like an ocean that a little bit of sand has been thrown into. The love of the Father is not affected by your sin. The love of the Father is not affected by the, the mistakes we make. The Father, in this parable, sits and waits. The second the Son leaves, He sits and He waits. He's just waiting. His mercy is available. He's just waiting. Um, my wickedness cannot change the feeling of forgiveness from God. God's forgiveness is automatic. It's for you to take. But, unfortunately, some of us don't return to it. But we have to understand that part of this journey is remembering that the Father's love for me does not change. Nothing you can do is wicked enough. Nothing you can do is bad enough. Nothing you can do is deep enough that God would not accept you back. And he's not, not only would he not, but is he not waiting to accept you back? Again, St. Isaac the Syrian says, Just as a strongly flowing fountain is not blocked up by a handful of earth, so the compassion of the Creator is not overcome by the wickedness of his creatures. So God's compassion cannot be used up. Okay, so that's um, the, the beginning step is recognizing that God's mercy is not um, limited. The next part of the journey is that as the son experiences famine, so he takes the money, he squanders it, and then he experiences famine, he has this moment of awakening. He has this moment where he says, um, what am I doing here? Couldn't I be a servant of my father? Um, St. Isaac the Syrian says, Repentance is the gateway to mercy, which is open for all who seek it. By way of this gate, we enter into divine mercy, and apart from this entrance, one cannot find mercy. So, there is a trigger point 
for the mercy of God. The mercy of God is waiting, as I said. But there's something that we do which triggers the mercy of God, which opens up the mercy of God. It's available to everyone, but there's something that we have to do to open it. And it's this idea of repentance. It's this concept of repentance, which is what the church is teaching us. This idea of waking to myself, of adjusting my behavior, of alerting myself to my mistakes. It's a moment of repentance. This step is absolutely critical to your journey. This moment is absolutely critical to your journey, is an awakening, is recognition of my mistakes. You know, I was reading yesterday the story of David and Saul. King, King David and King Saul, both of them made big mistakes. Both of them um, were made mistakes that God could have rejected them for. Okay, so, so King Saul first, he made an offering when he shouldn't have made an offering. He didn't obey the, the, the command of God. And so Samuel approaches Saul and he says to him, Saul, you've committed a sin. And Saul, what's his answer? He said, no, but the reason why I did it is this and this and this, and I had to do it this way. And Samuel says, no, you've been rejected. He said, okay, okay. Then just worship with me. He does not say, I have sinned against God. He does not say, let God accept me back. David, whose sin is much worse who killed a man, stole his wife, made her pregnant, didn't care about it. He put his army at risk for this guy, for this, this, um, this lust. The second David is alerted to his sin, his answer, I have sinned against the Lord. And he bows and he fasts. The difference between the two is simply repentance. Even Saul says, okay, 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 I did something wrong. Just, just come and, w- and save face with me. All he cares about is what the way people see him. But he's not repentant. And that's the difference. And that's why he was rejected. But David, whose sin was worse, was not rejected. In fact, his kingdom was forever. David's kingdom was forever. He came in the line, line of Christ. So this idea of repentance is critical to my journey. This idea of repentance is the lesson that we learn. The good thing that the younger son did here was repent. He woke up to himself. The way the Bible says it is he woke to himself. So this idea that we need to wake up to ourselves is a critical part of this journey. It's it's the most necessary part. It's the thing that triggers the mercy of God. It's It's the thing that triggers the mercy of God. The next step as the son returns. So now the son has woken to himself and he walks back to the father. Um, is that we bring our guilt and our fee back, but we leave it at the door. We leave it at the door. It doesn't come all the way in with us. Um, St. Isaac the Syrian says, Fear is the paternal rod which guides us as far as the spiritual Eden. But once we have reached there, it leaves us and turns back. Eden consists in the divine love. So maybe what wakes me up is fear. Maybe what wakes me up is guilt. Maybe what... Uh, triggers me to go back is fear of consequences, that I don't want to be far away from God, that I don't bear the consequences of my mistakes. But it only brings me to the door. Once I enter the door, what does the Father do? He runs out. He robes me. He says, be merry. Come and have a feast. It's love that continues the journey. When I walk the journey with God, love is the driving force. It's not fear. Fear is the beginning point. It brings me to the door. But love is what continues. So, guilt has no place in the spiritual life except to return me to repentance. I don't sit and wallow in my guilt. Unfortunately, some of us, we hold on to our guilt and we never let it go, even when we've returned. We maintain our guilt. We feel that God could never accept me. And it's toxic. It keeps me actually from God. It becomes a mistake because it doesn't recognize the Father. The Father's sitting, waiting. He's robing the people he wants you in the feast he doesn't want you staying outside feeling lousy he just wants the guilt just to bring me back that's all and then i leave it behind so part of this journey actually is to be clean cleansed and to leave the guilt and the fear and to continue on with love and faith and that's of course one of the gifts of repentance so even if coming back i can't see how the guilt will leave me once i recognize the 
the forgiveness of the Father, the consequence, of course, is love. I start to recognize the love of God, and I start to love Him back in a proper way. The last stage, which is the, the nicest stage, is the reward of sin. It's an unusual um, statement, but the reward of sin. Then the way that St. Isaac the Syrian says it, he says this. He says, the reward of sinners is this. Instead of a just reward, God grants them resurrection. And in place of bodies that trampled on his laws, he robes them in the glory of perfection. The grace which raises us into new life after we have sinned is greater than the grace which brought us into being when as yet we were not. So he's saying that the reward of sinners, you will be rewarded for being a sinner as long as you return. You will have a gift for being a sinner as long as you return. And the gift that you will get, the grace that you get for returning is more than when God first created us. It's a big statement. We bounce higher after repentance. It's the highest spiritual level, according to lots of the fathers, this idea of returning to God. And we take that, of course, from lessons from, say, for example, the right thief, the first one to enter the kingdom. He's the biggest sinner, the guy who's sitting on the cross next to Christ after committing his crime and suffering the consequences of his crime. That God doesn't know how to hold a grudge. You know, from all the characteristics of God, we understand certain things that he doesn't know how to be harsh. When you read the Old Testament, read it carefully. People will see the Old Testament as something that we see harsh God. He's, he's wiping people out. He's killing. But read it carefully. You'll see that God does not know how to be harsh. The second that you say, sorry, please, don't, don't, God. God always relents. Every time. You will never see him uh, rebuking without saying, in the end, I will glorify you. I will raise you up. The second someone bows down and says, God, I am, I am a sinner. God says, okay, stand up. See how he's humbled himself. The worst kings in the Old Testament. God does not have capacity to be harsh if we are repentant. Even every sin carries a consequence, but even then God will carry that consequence for you. He will remove it from your life. Every, the reward of a sinner who repents is glory. The psalm gives us the same lesson today. It says, let your tender mercies come speedily to us. Forget, uh, do not remember former iniquities against us. For we have been brought very low. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. The character of God, the way he shows his glory is forgiveness. His method is not by power. is not to show, look how strong I am. That's not how God shows his glory. He shows it in meekness and he shows it in forgiveness. For the glory of God is through his forgiveness. And that's the character of God. That's the personality of God. And that's the reward of those who return. So the journey that we walk through Lent is meant to trigger this process in us. We are meant to go through this process of, unfortunately, we sin. Like it or not, we sin. But we are me meant to recognize that God's mercy is waiting. And therefore, if we repent, if we stand up and open our hearts and our minds to this idea of committing sin... That we come to God, guilt is removed, fear is removed, and in place is reward, is glory. And the glory of God is manifested in that. So let us, be um, let us recognize the invitation given to us by this parable of the prodigal. Let us be inside the feast, not outside, like the older son, and, and come inside and start the process of repentance today. Let it be today. Don't wait as we start our process of repentance. And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>